A technological revolution which led to the discovery of a huge amount of shale gas in the USA. It's a great development as many believe that the rules of the game of the energy sector has changed. And the uh, organization is wondering if the USA will, allow, will announce its independence vis-a-vis -vis energy. And this will definitely change the priorities. Welcome to this conference organized by Arabia on the Mar and the periphery of the WEF held in the Dead Sea. Dear audience of Arabia and dear guests, thank you for being with us in this session organized by Arabia's channel on uh, the gas and shell gas and global transformations and regional impact. I'd like to welcome my guests. Uh, to my right, there is Dr. Aldo flores Giro, the Secretary General of the International Energy Forum, Riyadh. Also, we have uh, Dr. Faisal Gagab, member of board, National Oil of Corporation, Livia. They have billions of investments in many sectors, particularly oil inside and outside of Libya. Welcome. Also, I have Dr. Robert Kaplan, the chief geopolitical analyst in Stratford in the USA. Welcome. And we have Dr. Anas al Haji, chief economist in NGP, energy capital management in the USA as well. As well. Welcome. Dear guests, uh, I would like to pinpoint that uh, you can direct your questions to the presenter, to the speakers during specific times in the session, and I will tell you when. We are talking about revolution in shale gas. Let us get to know the technology which allowed to, come, uh, to extract shale gas. We will look together uh, and see on graphic animation what is the hydraulic fracturing, which is called fracking also. A well will be drilled perpendicularly to reach the shale earth layers to discover shale gas, and then a horizontal well will be drilled and high pressure water would be injected that will lead to the cracking of the earth layer. This would uh, get rid of the bacteria and soil granules and it will leave the cracks open so that the shale gas can come out. And this is how shale gas is extracted. Let us start our conversation. I will start with Dr. Flores. The shale gas uh, extraction in US USA is called a game changer. It has changed the rules of the game. Do you agree? And what are the repercussions on the rest of the world? United States, without a doubt, uh, this is a major transformation in the market for oil and gas uh, in the US and by extension in North America. Uh, it is changing the way uh, oil and gas are produced. It is the way oil is priced. It is changing the pattern of trade for uh, North America. Is it a game changer for the rest of the planet? The, and in what terms? This is a question that still requires uh, much more attention. We are uh, seeing that the impact in the rest of the world so far is mediated through markets by the displacement of coal, for example, in, in Europe in favor of, uh, I mean, of gas in favor of, of coal in, in the case of Europe, by the greater perspectives for LNG trade that might occur in the Pacific due to the exports that might come from the United States. So the first stage of this game changer is happening in the US, and there might be a second stage, which is the spread of this revolution to the rest of the world. That uh, will take at least some uh, 10, years, at least from the, the, those are the optimistic projections of what can happen in the rest of the world. It requires uh, much more knowledge about the geology uh, in, in other continents, which, by the way, is favorable, and uh, a set of, of policies and regulations that 
might enable the investment uh, at the scale that we are seeing them in the US. Then again, it's not uh, right now clear that we will see an increase with the size and the speed that we have seen in the United States for uh, the production of unconventional oil and, and gas. So the first stage is the US, the second stage might go to the rest of the world. But I would not uh, want to leave the impression that this is a foregone conclusion. One of the important uh, issues to be addressed in this expansion of uh, oil and gas production is the environment. There are uh, legitimate concerns about how water will be used, about water availability in general, about uh, the environmental footprint in general of, of this production. And uh, if these are not well taken care of, they can slow down the revolution or even stop it. We were surprised by the rise in production from shale. We, uh, there's no reason why we couldn't be surprised by, by something that uh, reduces its, uh, its speed. Uh, again, if the precautions are not taken care of. But what this is promising, uh, to summarize, is greater uh, abundance of, of oil and gas, which implies a shift in trade patterns, a shift in the energy mix that is used in different regions. Some will be relying more on gas or oil or renewables, depending on the economics of each of these regions. And even a shift in the way that oil and gas are priced, more likely uh, toward markets in which more competitive pricing is incorporated. And uh, that will, of course, involve shifts in the use of infrastructure uh, that will be required to make gas uh, uh, a commodity that is traded in similar terms as soil is nowadays. Uh, you have mentioned many points, Dr. Flores, that you will discuss during this session. I have a point of clarification. You've thought about, uh, talked about replacing gas. Uh, you've talked about replacing gas with coal in Europe. Is that because USA exports coal? to Europe. I will get back to you on this question. We will move to Dr. Gergab. Many of the points were raised, but I would like to listen to your viewpoint vis-a-vis -vis oil producers and, v and oil exporters. Libya is one of the main oil exporters. How do you view this uh, phenomenon? How would it change the dynamics of investment in oil and gas since you are one of the major investors in these fields? Thank you. I would like to clarify the changes that were brought about by the discovery of shale gas in the presence of new energy systems worldwide. We know that there is what is called the uh, traditional or conventional uh, energy and hydrocarbons. They represent 60% of the the world energy uh, resources in, represented in oil, gas, uh, coal, and nuclear energy. The rest is supplemented with renewable energy, what is called. And according to the studies, this will not reach levels higher than 30, 20 to 30%. If we view the changes that took place worldwide, according to the indicators of uh, the UN, for the population growth, we found that the population would increase from 7 billion to 9 billion in the second half of the century. And this will lead to more demand on energy. So the world is facing real challenge in finding renewable energy sources. The revolution of shale gas is a real revolution which started in the 60s of the past century in the USA, in Russia, and other areas. However, technology has taken uh, many steps forward. Uh, the fractioning has become advanced methodologies w with environmental uh, prospects. The use of water is uh, actually uh, sustainable. Water use is usually reused water or recycled water. And these are really challenges for the government to deal with such developments to find systems and legal systems and contractual systems that would allow the companies and investors to find real opportunities to develop shale gas. 
Shale gas differs from the other regular stereotype gas or traditional gas in that it needs capital investment, huge capital investments. As I clarified, the, we have the horizontal drilling. We need thousands of um, wells uh, so that we can use it on a commercial basis and we can liquidify. So, but the investment is taking place in the USA. Investment has been injected. This huge capital investment has been injected. In the USA, the infrastructure is very developed. So extraction of the gas is a priority for the electricity regeneration. But if we go to the Middle East, this needs huge capital exp expending. And so we need to change the conventional contracting methods because uh, the abscess and abscess are not in harmony with production and exploration. So there should be a balance struck. Is it a revolution? Yes, it is a real revolution. USA production of shale gas is 25%. Total production reached 100 billion cubic meters, which is 25%. The expectations show that this production would increase by 50% of total production. USA now is exporting of liquefied gas. How does this impact the region? the region of the Middle East, it will impact. We need to open new markets. Asian markets are promising. Population will amount 2.6 billion. Number of cities will increase by 1.3 by a city every week in Asia, according to the population growth rate. So energy demand will always be ever growing. So we need to find new energy resources. We will stop at this point of repercussions on the Middle East, but we will point. We will continue with the introductory remarks uh, of the speakers. Mr. Kaplan, you are a specialist in geopolitics, and when there's a new phenomenon, either its um, effects are uh, exaggerated or the opposite. There is a debate if uh, the shale gas uh, revolution would impact the foreign policy of the US, USA, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Middle East and Asia. I would like to listen to your viewpoint on that. I think the discovery of shale gas will influence US foreign policy in the Middle East, but only gradually only in a very nuanced way over time and only the way it interacts with the way the U.S. has been humbled in Iraq and the way the U.S. is being demanded to play a bigger security role in, in, the, in East Asia, in the Pacific, because of the military rise of China. It's the combination of all these things that will lead to perhaps over time a distancing of the US from the Middle East. Let me unpack this a little bit. It's not just shale discoveries in Texas, Louisiana, North Dakota, Western New York State, Ohio, which are huge. It's also the, the, um, the assumption that despite President Obama's veto, that eventually the US will be importing large amounts of oil from the tar sands of northern Alberta, that's in central western Canada, that with the passing of Chavez in Venezuela, there may be more U.S. investment to rejuvenate the Venezuelan oil industry, uh, increasing energy interaction between the U.S. and Mexico, so that there's this perception among the Washington elites in the military, in the media, in government, that greater North America, from Alaska to Venezuela, is becoming energy self-sufficient. Of course, just like you diversify your stock portfolio, you diversify your energy portfolio for not just political reasons, but for complex technical reasons. So that I, I don't believe the US will ever stop importing oil from the Persian Gulf, but it may go down even more. It was uh, during the 1973 Middle East War, the Persian Gulf was a primary lifeblood for the US economy. 
Um, it was a primary US strategic interest. Over time, it may devolve to a secondary strategic interest, getting 10%, 5%, or less of oil. Why is it, what is a secondary strategic interest? If a primary strategic interest is you need that oil for your autos and your economy, a secondary strategic interest is as the main global power, as a liberal maritime power, you protect the international order. Uh, you, you provide production and access to hydrocarbons to your friends and allies around the world. You protect this, the great sea lines of communication. This will continue to be a US strategic interest for decades to come. But again, this is secondary. It's not at the same level as we need that oil for our autos so to speak. But at the same time, as the US pivots to Asia because of the rise of China, keep in mind that China is moving closer to the Middle East. Because, the US, because China needs Persian Gulf um, or Middle East oil and natural gas to a greater and greater extent. So the interaction between East Asia and the Middle East gets greater and greater. And that, that presents the US not with deserting the Middle East, but with seeing more of a fluid, organic continuum stretching from uh, the South China Sea and the East China Sea all the way to the Western Indian Ocean, including the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So it's, it's think of an organic geography rather than the US deserting the Middle East. And all this will happen over time, because geopolitical changes, though they do occur suddenly in some respects, more often they're very gradual. I think it has to do also with the self-sufficiency of the United States. We'll tackle that. We'll speak uh, about uh, uh, or about the fact that the USA might be moving towards self-sufficiency. Dr. Haji, you also have uh, intake on uh, the exploration of shale gas. It is a revolution, but we, what we have heard about the repercussions on the Middle East. Um, under my house in the Barnet Trail. This is just a joke. Uh, yes, it is a revolution. Because one of the concepts of revolution is that it changes the balance completely. The USA and the production of gas in the USA decreased gradually. Now it's increasing. Production of gas was decreasing. Now it's increasing. The USA was building uh, stations for liquefied gas. Now it is building stations for exploitation. Petrochemicals was migrating from the USA. Now it's coming back to the USA. As for the impact in general on the Middle East states and the Gulf area, because of the time limit, I will summarize such points in the following. First, uh, there is no direct impact for the increase of uh, the USA oil on the Gulf oil. There's no direct impact. As I've said, there is an indirect impact, rather. Number two, uh, uh, fear for Gulf oil is not from the USA, but for Canada, because the ca the quality of the new uh, USA gas is a light gas. This light gas, in fact, competes with the Libyan oil, the Nigerian oil, the Algerian oil, and the Angolian oil, but it does not compete with the oil of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, or Kuwait to the USA. Accordingly, even cutting down the imports is not true. If we look into the data over the past month, we find the following. A decrease of the USA imports from Algeria, uh, Angola, and uh, Algeria, but from the, the imports of, uh, from, US, from the Saudi Arabia and Kuwait is increasing. We are talking about a revolution. With regards to gas, the USA will export liquefied gas. The fourth point is that there are great problem vis-a-vis -vis exporting the uh, the petrochemical pro uh, products the uh, the crude the USA crude oil cannot uh, 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 cannot be exported it's prohibited well those can be changed but we find that the USA crude oil is very low in price so the refineries uh, refine the crude, uh, the US 
crude oil and then sell its products. If this continues, what would be the destiny of the new refineries built in the Gulf and other areas because they are also for the sake of experts? The final point, the final point is that the petrochemicals, the USA petrochemicals industry over the upcoming 10 years will threaten the Gulf petrochemicals industry. We will listen to the viewpoint, a person uh, who was one uh, of uh, the very prominent figures of petrochemicals industry in the Gulf. And you can maybe respond also to the competition of the Libyan oil. We will view uh, uh, the viewpoint of uh, the Saudi uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs regarding the, the oil independence of uh, USA. Al-Naimi Yukhalif disagrees. He doesn't think that the US a would be independent uh, oil wise we are all part of uh, uh, the world market no when no country can be independent i don't believe in the industry or in the viewpoint of the independence of oil so U USA would not uh, actually uh, confine itself away from international affairs. So this was the viewpoint of Saudi Arabia. Can we listen to the viewpoint of Libya? Yes, I'd like to make a comment about uh, Libyan oil. Most of our experts go to Europe. Uh, so I believe uh, that uh, the oil sufficiency of the USA might not have any effect or any impact on Libya. However, I believe that uh, when we talk about energy, we need to think about which countries are asking for energy these days. Uh, Japan is one of the biggest countries asking for energy because of the catastrophe that it has witnessed uh, a few years ago. And there's a lot of demand on liquefied uh, gas in uh, Libya, in, um, in Japan. And many uh, experts, uh, many oil experts and liquefied gas experts from Qatar go to Japan. The markets also in China and in Asian countries are um, high on demand for oil and gas. And I believe that they will provide opportunities for oil and gas from Arab countries. When it comes to the shale gas or shale oil revolution in the Arab world, I believe that there is an effect of that revolution. There is a lot of shale gas in Jordan, in Tunisia, in Lebanon. There are a lot of reserves, about 50 trillion cubic feet of shale gas in, in some of these Arab countries. And I believe that such huge reserves are very important. Of course, when you talk about reserves, we have proven reserves. And these proven reserves are reserves that are proven to exist. And there are technically recoverable reserves. These are the reserves that can be extracted one day. However, all indicators show that the Middle East region is full of these alternative energy resources. I'm going to go back to this issue later on. Dr. Flores, I would like to listen to your point of view. Do you agree with what has been said by the Minister of Oil from Saudi Arabia, who said that there was no intention uh, in the USA to be energy self-sufficient in the future? Does the USA want to be self-sufficient? Does it, uh, would it want to be self-sufficient? Self-sufficiency. I think it's a, a, a good point here to echo some of what uh, Robert said earlier. There is uh, uh, really no such thing as an energy independent country. Uh, the, the golden rule for energy security is diversification. And uh, to build uh, resilient energy systems, we need redundancies, we need diversification of energy sources, and we need a geographical diversification of, of imports. So uh, it is not the case that the United States will be uh, an economy that will not be relying on imports of uh, energy resources, be there maybe less of gas, less of oil, as, as one mentioned. But uh, we have uh, an interconnected, interdependent value chain in, 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 in the energy field that affects uh, all sources of energy. And, uh, and in that regard, it's very unlikely that we will see that type of situation. The, the, the way towards energy security, the way forward, 
involves embracing interdependence and not moving away from it. A prime example of what interdependence and diversification can mean for energy security is Japan. Uh, think of the accident in the, the Fukushima nuclear plant with all those serious implications. What would have happened to Japan if Japan had only pursued a policy of energy independence based, for example, on nuclear energy? Of course, this was not the case. Well, facing such a disaster, it would not have been able to source gas, oil, and other uh, energy sources from other parts of the world. So having diversified energy mix, diversified geographical, uh, diverse imports that are diversified geographically, energy efficiency measures, and thinking of the energy system as a whole is key. This applies for the US, for Saudi Arabia, for Brazil, for any country that uh, is seeking to, to build a secure, safe energy system. I shall now open the floor for a discussion, but before that, we will take a short break. We're resuming in a second. <laughs> yeah. Mish am basma. Hisham saw takter baid. Hala, okay. Mushahidina. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this session held at the sidelines of the World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea. We are discussing shale gas and oil and its impact on the region. I uh, said that I was going to open the floor to the audience, but uh, before opening the floor to the audience, uh, we talked about uh, petrochemical producers in the Middle East, and I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Abdel we have Al Saadoun, who is from the Gulf. Welcome, doctor. I uh, would like to ask you if you think that there is a real threat on the petrochemical industry in the Gulf. Thank you, Nadine. And thank you to the panelists, Dr. Anas. Actually, Dr. Anas has given us a pessimistic vision about the situation in the region. I don't think that the discovery of shale gas and oil will have a negative impact on, petrochemi on the petrochemical industry in the Gulf, because the petrochemical industry in the Gulf has many comparative advantages. Of course, one of its advantages is its price, but it has many other comparative advantages, including the advanced infrastructure that we have in the Gulf, including the modern technology that we are using, the scale economies, the economies of scale that we are adopting, we, especially in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and in the United Arab Emirates. We have some of the biggest production facilities in the world. And we are quite close to the main markets, especially in Asia and in China. It is true that there are many advanced technologies used in the world to transform uh, coal into gas and into other petrochemical products. Despite this, China will always be a, a key importer of petrochemical products. I believe that shale gas has become a reality. And of course, it will have an impact on the world. But I believe that its main impact will be on producers in areas such as Europe, Japan, South Korea, and other areas in, in Asia. These countries that use petrochemical products a lot. I would like to underline the following point. The shale gas revolution points in one direction, it comes to show us that even though shale gas and shale oil has existed over so many years, we have known for such a long time that it does exist. However, we have not reached the necessary 
technology, technological developments that would make its extraction possible. We have only obtained those technologies in the past few years. This means that we need to invest more in our technologies in order to develop our industries, shale gas industries and conventional industries. What is said by Dr. Abdel Wahab is very true. However, I wanted to comment on the issue of the Libyan gas and on what was said by the Minister of Oil from Saudi Arabia. The imports of the USA from Angola, from Nigeria, and from Algeria have been reduced by 1 million and 800 barrels a day. Now, these countries need new markets to replace this USA market. And there are many indicators that those, new, those countries are actually competing with Libyan oil in Europe. It is true that the USA is not importing oil from Libya, but because it is no longer importing gas from those other three countries that I have mentioned, these countries have started competing with Libyan oil in Europe. One important thing is that petrochemicals produced in the USA need to be adapted with the facilities and with the factories that are used. We have oil that is coming from North Dakota and coming from other um, states in the USA. This is light oil. And I believe that all other quantities in the future will be light oil. But the refineries, the refineries that we have are not adapted to that oil. But um, we have seen that the technology has changed, and we have seen that the USA has managed to adapt its technology and to improve its technology. So why do you think that these refineries will not actually also adapt? In the past years, many dollars were spent in order to rehabilitate refineries and make them capable of dealing with the, with the heavy oil that is coming from Canada. I don't think that those refineries will go back to investing such huge amounts of money now to be able to deal with light uh, oil. These uh, oil companies in the USA have actually achieved high profits in the, ba in the past few months and years, uh, profits that have not been witnessed before. So why would they change their strategies now? I would like to give the floor to the audience. We have a few questions from the audience in the first row. I am engineer Isam Salim, and I work in the, in, in the oil uh, industry, and I'm now a freelance consultant. Uh, I wanted to ask you, these new discoveries of shale gas and oil, will they impact oil prices throughout the world? And if they do, won't that impact Gulf states? If shale gas and shale oil production increases, it will lead to a reduction in prices. Maybe we'll see oil prices like the ones we saw in the past. We at NGP company, we believe that oil prices will not go down, will not drop regardless of the quantities of oil produced in the USA. There are many reasons for this. Arab revolution countries and the, the south of Sudan, they have not been able to produce oil and to send it, its oil to, the, to international markets like they used to be. I believe that there is a huge reduction in production of oil from northern sea markets. So I believe that even if shale gas and oil are produced on a massive, uh, in a ma massively, this will not lead to the reduction of prices of oil in Gulf states. There are also pipelines being built, and I believe that those pipelines will actually lead to the exportation of 1 million and 200 barrels of oil from uh, the Middle East to Asia, from the, United, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from Iraq to uh, Asian countries. And I believe that maybe after 2018 we might witness some problems. I have another question. I'd like to give the floor. all the new oil and shale being produced, we're also going to see an explosion in the numbers of middle classes around the world. 
um, China and India and even in sub-Saharan Africa, which have, has the highest economic growth rates in the world, you're seeing the, the explosion of the numbers of people who are entering the middle class. And middle classes consume energy to a much greater extent than poor people do. Uh, there's another question. I am from Iraq. I would like to make two comments. First of all, OPEC. As you all know, OPEC is an organization that defends prices. And I believe that if oil prices are to drop, maybe OPEC will decide to reduce production. Another issue, we are inflating the impact of shale gas and shale oil, and maybe this inflation will lead OPEC to limit its investments. And this could be very dangerous, because Asia, as you know, needs crude oil and needs huge quantities of oil in general. Thank you for this. I would like to show you a map, a map of shale gas reserves in the world. As you can see, the biggest surprise is the difference between China and the USA. We're talking about a revolution when it comes to the extraction of gas in the USA, but look at the number that comes from China and compare between the numbers in the USA and the numbers in China. What will happen if China is to start extracting shale gas? I would like to address this question to you, Mr. Kaplan. To which extent do you think that China can pose a threat in this field? And to whom would that threat be uh, addressed? And what is China doing now to secure its energy resources? Uh, so what is it doing? Um, first of all, uh, sh the extraction of shale is very water intensive. Uh, China has a real strategic water problem. Uh, the diminishing of the underground water table. So this is an issue that China is going to have to face. Now, China has an autocratic government, which means it can get around regulations uh, re uh, more easily than, say, the government in Australia or, or, or places. And it can use the development of shale to develop interior China as opposed to coastal China, which is already developed. But think China doesn't so much have a foreign policy as it has a resource acquisition policy. Uh, it is in desperate need of hydrocarbons, strategic minerals, and strategic metals from any place it could find it to, to take hundreds of millions of Chinese and propel them into the middle class. So, and, but the, China has a problem. It's called the Strait of Malacca, which is very narrow, and China doesn't want to have to depend on it for importing Middle Eastern energy across the global energy interstate, which is the Indian Ocean, through the Strait of Malacca, and up, until, up into the Pacific Basin. So China's doing many things. Uh, China has um, built deep water ports in, in Myanmar. Um, uh, in, or, in order to develop, in, in order to import natural gas, put it through a pipe. They've built pipelines and highways to take the gas across north central Myanmar directly into Kunming, into western China. China is building pipelines uh, for natural gas and oil into Central Asia. Every, it's importing from Africa. It's doing everything it can to diversify and to get, to get energy from wherever it can, where, however it can, to provide propel this mid growing middle class. But may I comment on the issue of China? I was in China last week, and I was discussing, discussing this issue of shale, of shale gas. The cost of producing shale gas in China is, is around $6, and the cost in the USA is around $4. Now, all the reserves that are mentioned in, uh, on the map are reserves that are far away from the uh, areas where the population lives or the majority of the population lives. So these numbers actually mean nothing on the ground if you compare them with the costs. Dr. Flores, I'd like to listen to your opinion when it comes to the possibility of extracting shale gas and producing shale gas and oil in China. 
Sure. Let me just uh, first uh, make a cautionary note uh, uh, regarding the discussion of prices. We don't know where prices are going. And uh, it's, uh, it's really adventurous to, to make predictions uh, in that regard. We saw yeah, at moments in which the world economy was booming, prices that were also falling. So uh, I, I don't think that it is wise to uh, project prices uh, for that uh, or to predict prices for such a long period of time that uh, will be depressed, as was suggested, or probably uh, sustained by a process of increasing demand has been explained with respect to what is going on with Asia. What we see, uh, however, is that the increase in Asian demand, the increase in demand from, that will be coming from Africa and probably South America will, uh, will be able to absorb the supply that will be coming uh, into the market. But again, I, I would shy away from making uh, any price uh, predictions. Uh, uh, history already has uh, taught us that, uh, that lesson. With respect to that uh, map, one thing to underscore is that basically everything that is outside the United States is right now at the level of speculation in the sense that we're still trying to understand better what is the nature of these geological formations, what are the requirements in terms of technology, and human uh, capital and skills and uh, regulations that will be required to bring these uh, shale resources into the market. Uh, China indeed has a framework that may, uh, may, make, uh, may allow it to move faster, partly because it also has a, a service industry that is more deeper and manufacturing base that uh, is more developed than other countries. But it is not preordained that uh, that is the, the conclusion. Australia has uh, considerable resources. Uh, well, anyway, the, the, the map is identifying them. The key point is that at this stage, it's uh, very difficult to tell where the next uh, revolution in production is going to come from. China is definitely a very strong candidate. Australia is another strong candidate. Uh, Canada as well. Uh, and yet, the observers that are looking at this carefully don't see, as I mentioned, either a fast uh, increase in production or a magnitude in the increase that like I the American. I ask you about Saudi. Uh, Saudi. Saudi Arabia said that it wants to develop shale oil. Do you think that this is possible? Yes, it is possible. Saudi Arabia has. Uh, a company that is very able and has expertise. The, the challenge, of course, has to do with uh, water availability, with uh, various aspects uh, of cost and distribution. As, but the as, water issue was a major point that was raised in the media. Yes, it, 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 is, it, it, it is an issue. It has to be addressed. But uh, look, the, the use of water in, in the US uh, per well fract has been uh, declining. Uh, and um, the technology may develop in such a way that uh, the amount of water that is going to be used uh, will be less. Uh, let's say that it's still a wait and see proposition, but the potential is, is very strong. And I think we should all welcome that there's going to be more availability of oil and gas also in the Middle East. Dr. Gerab, I would like to Dr. Agarab, I would like to listen to your point of view when it comes to the possibility of developing and producing shale gas and oil in the Middle East. Actually, I agree with my colleagues when they spoke about China and the possibility of producing shale gas. Actually, if shale gas exists in China, it exists, exists in many geographically difficult and remote areas, and so extracting that gas would be quite difficult. In the Middle East, the situation is difficult. It's different, but what we need is for governments to adapt, to issue new legislations and laws and contractual agreements that would allow us to look for and to extract shale gas and oil. So we need to look into these contractual arrangements that cannot be conventional. We need a general framework, we need legal frameworks, and we need laws that, are, that do not exist now that would enable us to develop our production of gas and of shale gas and oil. I don't think that we will lack markets in order to market this shale gas and oil. Of course, there are new markets in the world that 
come and grow every day. There is a huge demand on gas and oil, and so I believe that what we need now is to put forward the necessary legislations and the necessary framework for shale gas and oil. When it comes to the extraction of shale gas and oil outside the USA, I would like to ask Mr. Kaplan, what about Europe? We know that Europe has huge reserves of shale gas and oil. However, the population in Europe is against the extraction of shale gas and oil because of its environmental footprint. Germany and France have huge reserves of shale gas and oil. What, and Poland too. What would this mean for Europe? What would the fact or would Europe turn to shale gas and oil in order to avoid importing gas and oil from Russia, for example? Yes, as you said, Russia is the big question. At the moment, if you look at a map of Europe, you will see it crisscrossed with existing pipelines and proposed pipeline systems emanating from Russia into Poland, south stream, up through Bulgaria, uh, the former uh, Yugoslavia, into Hungary. Uh, Russia's goal is that it no longer, the Warsaw Pact is disintegrated, but Russia is right next door. And Russia has been invaded not just by French and Germans, but by Swedes, Lithuanians, and Poles. And Russia requires a buffer zone in Eastern Europe. It, it, the Soviet Union collapsed because the empire was too expensive. That's not what Vladimir Putin wants. What he wants is a soft, traditional zone of influence in Central and Eastern Europe. And, it, he's, and, and the tool he He's using for the most part, there are others, is making Eastern and Central Europe increasingly energy dependent on Russia, as well as Western Europe too. Now, as you alluded to, this, you know, shale gas discoveries, not just in the European countries you mentioned, but in the United States and elsewhere, could have the impact of lowering gas prices worldwide and also it, it being able to import uh, natural gas from places other than Russia. Uh, the Poles, the Latvians, I believe, um, uh, it's not just a matter of shale in Poland, which is proving to be a bit of a disappointment but also um, of building a regasification re facilities on the Baltic Sea, because again, shale has to be, gas has to be, you need a liquefaction facility to turn it into liquid, transport it over the ocean, then regasify it um, uh, 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 at, the, at the egress point. And so the Poles and, and, and Baltic states are desperate for alternative sources of energy so that they do not have to be dependent on Russia because, uh, because they, they, uh, geopolitics still exists in Eastern Europe. There's still this fear of Russia, especially as NATO weakens and because of the EU's fiscal crisis, the EU's geopolitical footprint in Eastern Europe is, is lighter than it was a decade ago. So this is a drama that will, you know, that will be playing out over the years, and it's a big question mark. How much can shale in North America, in Western Europe, et cetera, regasification plants, how they can alleviate the dependency of countries like Poland, Romania, on Russia? على كل مشاهدينا نلقي نظرة معا على هذه الخارطة. Ladies and gentlemen, let's look at this map. Uh, this shows us uh, where it is allowed to do fracking and where it is prohibited to do so. The red zone is the prohibited zone where fracking cannot be used for environmental reasons uh, primarily, in addition to, uh, to some other reasons. In the UK, it is allowed to start fracking following an initiative or several initiatives that have been adopted uh, to uh, incentivize uh, the communities where fracking will take place. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to comment on this issue. Dr. Al-Hajjaji, uh, this uh, map does not mean anything. Uh, whether uh, this uh, fracking is allowed or not uh, means nothing. Uh, the main reason for revolution is uh, private property in uh, Latin America and in the USA. So the technology was there, but the uh, property. You mean that those who own the land uh, can give the possibility to? Yes, there is a property of uh, the minerals and property of uh, the surface. Uh, that's why I wanted to say 
that uh, my, the revolution has started at the door of my house, right in front of my house in Texas. That was a joke that I cracked uh, in the beginning of this session. So uh, again, I say uh, all these areas are not private property. So we have to be aware of another point as well. The um, shale itself or the uh, uh, rocks uh, themselves are not similar. Uh, just like your fingers, imagine that uh, your fingers. Ima imagine that you will have uh, a, a hotel with uh, ten thousand keys, and you have to look for your uh, key and for your uh, hotel uh, for your uh, room. You mean that the know-how uh, for the shale. Uh, gas in the USA cannot be applied uh, throughout the world? Yes, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. If, uh, if we don't have the expertise, we will not be able to do that, just like uh, the several uh, keys. Um, is it because of the geography? Yes, because of the varying uh, geology. Uh, in uh, China and Asia, uh, there is a lot of uh, depth, uh, and the shale oil is, at, uh, um, is very deep, uh, but in uh, the USA, in Chesapeake, for example, we see that, uh, and even in uh, uh, Chesapeake has suffered from Ohio, Pennsylvania, although it has not suffered in other areas. Because, again, going back to that example of keys, uh, there are several keys to the same uh, technology. Sir, you have uh, talked about uh, property. That uh, is the reason why people are thinking about uh, environment. There are people that are benefiting from uh, their, uh, the land that they own uh, because uh, while others uh, don't benefit from it uh, in other areas of the world. That's why the people are against it. Mr. al hajjaji when we talk about environmental uh, problems, we have to look at the net, uh, uh, net uh, problems. Yes, there are some uh, uh, side uh, problems really uh, coupled with uh, production, but as uh, the uh, speaker, uh, the secretary general said a short while ago, if we look at uh, the conversion in electricity grids uh, from coal to gas, uh, the USA now is uh, closer uh, to Kyoto requirements, even though that USA is not a member of Kyoto. And if my environment has improved in the USA, the moderator, no. They say that they are producing coal and they are uh, exporting it to the Europe because uh, they are not committed to Kyoto. Uh, Al Hajaji, yes, but uh, look at the electricity sector and look at uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, they have been reduced to a, to a large extent in the USA, so much so that they have uh, uh, come very close to the Kyoto requirements. The moderator. Okay, we shall stop here uh, for a very short uh, break. Uh, now that we're talking about shale uh, gaze, uh, uh, gas has uh, started to go into the culture, uh, US uh, culture, and there is a very popular film about this uh, uh, issue, but we have to stop here for a very short break. Hussein, Twitter غير بالمرة عن موضوعنا. يعني بغير الموضوع. شفتوا بس ما قريتون بس قريتون. It's totally different topic. فخلنا نكفى. You want to comment on the topic or? Environment, definitely. And definitely. خلينا نرجع تكسير الهيدرولي حافظه هيدروليك فراكينج ان عربيك تكسير الهيدرولي طيب نرجع يلا جايز هشام صوتك مشاهدينا نعود مع Ladies and gentlemen, let's resume our session discussing the oil and uh, gas, shale uh, oil and gas. Uh, we are taking some questions from the audience. We have many people who are interested in this topic. So let's uh, start uh, with uh, the person who is sitting in the middle of the hall. Uh, she's been waiting for a long time. <laughs> I shall come back to you, ma'am. Can you please introduce yourself and to whom you are addressing your question? Abdul Salam Nasiya from Libya. Actually, the problem has various dimensions. 
uh, there is competition. Uh, when we're talking about competition of the shale uh, gas, however, we have to look at quantity, quantity of production on the one hand and its impact on the market and on the price and the cost on the other hand, whether uh, the uh, cost is competitive uh, to the production in uh, North Africa and the Gulf countries. There's another dimension. Uh, according to the map that we have seen, we have uh, oil, uh, uh, shale oil uh, in uh, the Gulf countries and in uh, Libya as well. Uh, so we can do that at a cost which is less than that uh, in the USA. I don't think there is a question of competitive competition uh, in the uh, short term. If the Gulf countries or North African countries are capable of producing uh, uh, shale oil uh, or extracting it and they find the appropriate uh, technology, then there would be no question of competition. Uh, there will continue to be reliance on the Gulf. Uh, I would like to under to see what you think of that. Do you have, is this addressed to any person in particular? Probably to Mr. Gergab. Uh, yes, since you are Libyan, let's uh, turn to the Libyan uh, panelist. Abdi Salam's uh, uh, statement is correct. Uh, the possibility of investment in uh, extraction of uh, shale oil uh, are very promising. And uh, given the fact that there is a lot, there is a boom in investment in uh, the na natural oil and gas, we can also use those investments by huge uh, corporations in uh, extracting uh, shale oil and shale uh, gas. Yes, there is a promising market. Uh, it is true there is a promising market. But ha as I have said a uh, short while ago, we need to change uh, the regulations. Uh, huge uh, corporations, oil, uh, multinationals will not accept the uh, current terms and conditions because uh, the capital investment is huge and capital uh, re restitution is also uh, very important. And this requires uh, hundreds of uh, wells uh, for hundreds of years. And the life cycle of the uh, wells uh, is very short, which means that they may they would need a different legislative uh, framework in order to keep up with this uh, revolution. So you wanted to, uh, to comment on the environment? Yes, uh, there are some very serious environmental uh, precautions uh, related to two issues. First, the use of water. Second, uh, the earthquakes. Uh, there are some unconfirmed uh, reports that in Lancashire, in uh, Britain, in the UK, for example, uh, uh, an earthquake took place. The moderator said, uh, I think that there was a problem uh, related to the way of drilling by the corporation. Uh, Mr. al -Gab. yes, uh, these are uh, reservations related to the technology. In the past, we used to certain dy dy dynamites to extract uh, gas, uh, but uh, technology has developed. And uh, Dr. Anas is so correct when he says that there are certain emissions, gas emissions, uh, that come from uh, the extraction of uh, uh, shale ga gas, uh, which is 300 uh, to 500 uh, cubic meter uh, in the USA, which is less than in other areas. Areas. So, yes, there are some uh, environmental uh, reserves or reservations, but uh, the, tech, uh, the corporations are working on them. Dr. Flores, uh, you had a comment also, and you wanted to make that comment uh, during the break. Would you like to make your comment now? Sure, I just wanted to add, uh, I, I agree with what uh, my colleague just said, that um, implicit in this uh, conversation uh, are two views about how to get to the future of the unconventional revolution outside the United States. One that says that we need something, uh, a framework, a set of conditions that is just like the one that the American uh, uh, industry had. And another one that suggests that basically all countries can jump into this uh, bandwagon, into this revolution. And I think that the second one is uh, is a wiser approach. We have seen unconventionals or, or oil that used to be unconventional 10 years ago or 20 years ago become conventional, and that was only produced in one region of the world and started to be producing elsewhere. And I'm thinking of the, of the for example, offshore uh, production that uh, is now, we now see it almost as conventional. So th what is unconventional today will be conventional in 10 years, and we are seeing that this Unconventional to conventional production is accompanied as well by uh, production in many different types of regimes. 
So there is a set of principles that indeed have to be respected, but there are different ways of structuring uh, investment regimes so that this is a successful endeavor. Let's take some questions from the audience. Dr. Sadun, you wanted to make an intervention. Can you please pass on the mic to Dr. Sadun? Yes, I wanted to add the following. The quality of the gas itself. The, the type or quality of uh, gas can revive certain uh, industries. There are still uh, open questions about the quality of the gas. Are we talking about uh, a gas that is uh, dry or that is uh, very liquid? If it is uh, um, dry and uh, it has methane as the main component, that would be appropriate for certain industries in the USA, such as electricity, glass, iron. But if it is a highly liquefied gas, then it would be uh, appropriate for petrochemical production. The main question of uh, related to shale gas in the USA is the following. If there are new regulations and there is surplus in the US market and uh, major corporations start talking about uh, exporting uh, shale gas, this would uh, increase the price, which means that the competitiveness of, that, of those industries would go down. This is in reply to the question that was the moderator. Yet uh, the main uh, prohibitor of uh, this is the main industries of the oil uh, industry that don't want to open this uh, possibility because uh, they, don't, they want to keep the prices low. Yes, ma'am, uh, this also requires a lot of investments uh, to liquefy the gas and to build up uh, export uh, infrastructure, which means that the competitiveness of uh, the exporters of shale gas would also be impacted. The moderator, maybe one of the panels can uh, comment on uh, exportation. Yes, sir, Mr. Al Hajjaji. The prices of uh, exportation of uh, shale gas uh, would increase. Uh, the problem is that uh, if the electricity uses, uh, uh, converts from coal to uh, gas, uh, the prices go up uh, by 23% last year and it would uh, be 40%. If the price is going to 4.5 uh, cents in the USA, uh, the electricity sector would not use this gas. Uh, the moderator, why? What would be an appropriate economic price? Uh, Mr. Al Haji, $3.80. $4.5 is too high for the electricity sector. We'll find that there are more than 12 million cubic. Uh, uh, um, quantities available on the market. Uh, yes, but it is said that the transportation sector and the locomotives are turning to this uh, shale gas. Yes, Mr. Al Hajazi says, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that exportation of liquefied gas would increase that price to uh, $4.5 uh, uh, and that the electricity uh, sector would uh, throw in uh, around 12 uh, billion cubic uh, cubes. Uh, with, so why why, why are we uh, scared of uh, the prices? And how, why are we scared uh, that it would impact the petrochemicals? And the cost of uh, oil uh, production in North Dakota, for example, is 40 to $50. So the question, if the prices go to $50, uh, would that may allow the corporations to make 50% return on, ca on investment, but can the oil countries accept uh, $50 only per barrel? Uh, the moderator, no, the breaking in price uh, is much higher, uh, partly. Mr. Kaplan, what do you think of exportation? For the very first time, Obama is allowing uh, uh, to give uh, licenses uh, to export LG, liquefied gas. Do you believe that this is something that is going to be on the rise, or will it take more time for other corporations to get such licenses? is to export liquefied gas. That they gave the first license to export LNG in the United States. Uh, the Obama administration was against that, probably because of all the lobbying internally to keep prices low. Do you think that uh, we will see more, more and more licenses given? Uh, we might. I can't, uh, I can't really answer that question. But what I can say is the larger question that you know that's emanating upwards is that the availability of shale gas in such large numbers in the United States and the closeness of oil in Canada and elsewhere is going to make the United States, with all of its foreign policy mistakes in the past, in the present, and in the future, the major world power. 
um, uh, because it's going to be in a better energy situation than China or, or any possible competitor will be. Uh, the United States will have, will, uh, will have options that a country like China simply does not have. And that, that is really the, you know, that, that's the real big story here. Uh, let's take another question. There are two persons, persons who, uh, who are raising their hands. Uh, we'll give you the possibility for both of you. Let's give it to the first person who raised his hand. Hanna Zaghloul from Qawar for Energy. For a long period of time, the U.S. policy impacted the region and was linked to the Gulf countries, mainly because of the existence of oil and uh, reserves, oil reserves the huge oil reserves in the Gulf, and the fact that the, the Gulf is an exporting uh, area. Now we see that the USA is uh, importing oil from Canada. Well, uh, the moderator, but it has its own uh, reliance. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what is the uh, future prospects uh, of the US policy vis-a-vis -vis the region uh, when it comes to the economic policy or political policy to the Middle East? Mr. Kaplan, I've, I was watching a panel in the London School of Economics, and they were saying uh, uh, that they will withdraw the American fleet from the USA, uh, from the Gulf. Uh, it seems that we're talking about this engagement of the USA in the Gulf countries because of shale gas. What do you believe? The U.S. is not going to withdraw the U.S. Navy from the, uh, fr from the region. What is happening, though, is the U.S. Navy is relocating 80 percent of its assets for the Persian Gulf region outside the Strait of Hormuz, which means a country like Oman is much more important to the United States because of its geographical location, um, and, and, you know, and its uh, you know and its ports, which are in the region but outside the Straits. Here's the way it works: the U.S. Navy has had what's called a 50/50 policy: 50 percent of warship assets in the Atlantic which means the Eastern Mediterranean as well and can mean the Western Indian Ocean, 50% in the Pacific, which also means the Eastern Indian Ocean. It's going from 50-50 to 60-40, 60% 60 60 in the Pacific. Again, that you know, the pivot to the Pacific is real in terms of military assets, but the pivot to the Pacific is an aspiration. It's not a declaration. It's an aspiration because it's what U.S. policymakers want to happen, the Middle East permitting. But the Middle East never permits. There's always a crisis in the Middle East that will continue to keep the U.S. involved because of what I said before. The U.S. may not need the Persian Gulf as much as a lifeline for U.S. energy, but the U.S. is the great liberal maritime power of the age, protects the sea lines of communication and access to hydrocarbons uh, for its allies and also promotes a favorable balance of power in the region. Let's take another question from the fourth row. Abdul al Qaq, I'm a journalist. I would like to ask the following. There are various apprehensions and fears that the modern technology would uh, lead to um, a usurp usurpation of uh, the oil in the Gulf. I have heard that one of the Gulf countries have only 25 years left uh, of oil. Uh, what do you think of those fears? Would that uh, really impact the production of uh, Gulf countries? Uh, of oil, of course. And I have another question. Can you give us an idea about uh, the uh, shale uh, gas in Jordan, and what are uh, the uh, difficulties in uh, producing this uh, gas in uh, Jordan? Because it is something new in Jordan, and it would be very important for us. Uh, the moderator, I think Dr. Haji can take up that question. Dr. Haji? Uh, the age of reserves uh, means nothing. It is just uh, something that is used in the media. It means nothing. Uh, 
let me explain what I mean. Uh, over 40 years, uh, uh, the reserves for the USA were 11 years, and they continue to be 11 years uh, for 40 years. Uh, and for the uh, Saudi Arabia, the reserve uh, potential is 35 years old, and it has always been the same number. So that number or that uh, figure doesn't mean really anything. The main problem uh, of which Gulf countries suffer nowadays is the um, hike in the local uh, 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 use uh, of uh, oil, gas, and uh, production. So you mean you, you want to talk about rationalization of uh, use. Um, Dr. Girgab, uh, uh, would, I would like to talk about LNG. And we know that there are uh, main uh, exporters of LNG, and they ha their prices have gone down because of what's happening in the USA. Do you believe that there will be continuous uh, pressure on the price of LNG? Yes, let me s uh, comment on what Dr. Hajazi said. Uh, no, reserves have a, a, an age limit. Uh, they are not endless resources. We say 35 years, 70 years, but they have a certain uh, hypothetical age, which means that there should be alternative uh, sources of energy. Just to answer that question. Okay, LNG. Uh, can you repeat your question? Yes, there is a pressure on uh, the price of LNG because there are uh, major exporters of LNG in the region that are worried uh, because of uh, the decrease of the prices uh, and the extraction of shale oil in the USA. If we look at the final investment decisions of the major uh, uh, seven uh, sisters, uh, we find that there are uh, major uh, projects for LNG in the Middle East. Uh, they have such major projects. Uh, they also have major projects in uh, Latin America. Uh, demand on uh, LNG has uh, gone down uh, or has vanished, virtually vanished in the USA, but it has gone up in India and China. So there is still a large uh, demand. The quantities available on the market have already been contracted. So the market is awaiting new uh, quantities that will come uh, in 2018, 2019. Yes, uh, about the prices in the USA in 2010 and uh, 11. The, it was sold for distress or uh, break-even prices, and the prices today are not as they used to be, but there are always uh, talk about uh, spot uh, carbons, and there are major uh, projects in this uh, field. Uh, we also have uh, G gas to liquid, uh, G to L, uh, TL, uh, and that uh, means that uh, there are gases that are highly liquefied, and they are regasified, uh, and uh, there are uh, factories in Brunei and Qatar uh, that talk about GTL. And uh, in the USA, they are thinking of using GTL uh, uh, for refineries that would use natural uh, uh, gas. And this is a boom. And there is uh, a demand on the market. But uh, it, there is a demand on the other byproducts of uh, liquefied gas because of, in, uh, uh, because of the environmental um, characteristics. Uh, this issue, says the moderator, is a large issue that cannot be covered uh, during a very short uh, session. I would like to thank the panelists for all their uh, input, and I would like to thank the audience as well for their questions and their um, uh, follow-up. Uh, the audience of Al Arabiya, please accept our gratitude. Uh, and uh, now we come to the end of this session that has been uh, broadcast to you from the World Economic Forum and at the Dead Sea in Jordan. Thank